There we go. Hello, now you should be able to hear me. Sorry, there's all sorts of weird stuff going on in my audio now. So, yeah, sorry, there's there's more audio inputs that I'm used to having. Very good. Oh, and uh, I'm also hearing things from another computer. So, Landon, uh, why don't you introduce yourself while I'm right back. Oh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone and latitude. From your friendly secular astronomer, I'm a planetary scientist, and uh, we study... I particularly study planets near the inner solar system, but planetary science uh, needs to rest upon how solar systems are form and evolve, how stars form, how galaxies form. So we're sort of at the pinnacle of, of what the uh, universe does. And uh, today I understand we have a uh, Halloween theme um, to going on. And so we will be talking about the Halloween characters of the stellar world namely stars uh in their afterlives um and so we'll be going over a conversation while uh, the dapper dinosaur is able to sort out his uh, evolutionary sonic uh should be good yeah should be good <laughs> sorry and, about that. Uh, but but all the other things sorry by the way uh uh there's a uh a uh, very friendly Canadian named uh, David that uh, sends his greetings. And also, um, he asked me to uh, uh, raise the specter that perhaps your monocle the, uh, the, that you have, uh, your your dinosaur monocle, is perhaps not real. Uh, I don't know if you have any any comments to make about that, but he asked me to raise that specter <laughs> in Halloween, right? All right. Well, so there's some first. There's some trivia about my my monocle, in mm. that it has a name. Its name mm. is Monocle Lewinsky. <laughs> yes. So there is that. Um, I would say that it is as real as everything else on my set is, and that is what I will say. The oranges, the Star Trek replicator, the Godzilla poster. My new floor, it is as real as any of those things. And that's very consistent. So Yes. Anyway, with, uh, with those introductions out of the way, <laughs> um, and I, 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 did, I did my duty for, for, for David, um, let's, uh, shall we get into uh, the uh, death <clears throat> of stars and their yeah. uh, zombie states? And their so I, I would like to start with uh, white dwarfs, if possible. Uh, which, you know, that'll be the fate of the sun, unless I'm very mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 white, white dwarf in, in, in the typical stellar model that, that we have. Um, obviously, we can't watch a star through its birth, lifetime, and death, because that, that tends to take too long. But we have many stars that we can see in, in their various stages of life, and so we can piece together the, 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 the puzzles, one of which is uh, white dwarfs. And for stars that are not super massive, uh, they uh, end their life in a, um, in, in a in a white dwarf phase. Okay. Where... Now, for clarification, what would count as super massive in terms of stars? Because I think most people, if you were to say weigh any given star, we all just say, "Well, that's pretty big." <laughs> yes. Um, and so, so it's not it's not really that 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 the stars are going on a diet, but that stars of 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 higher mass than our sun, certainly higher mass, will go through much more violent deaths than stars like our sun, which which will it'll have its it'll, it has its end of life phase, but it but essentially the the think of the I, I like to think of white dwarfs as sort of like the the embers of of 
of normal mass stars that are okay. just sitting there radiating and cooling away, except a couple of them get a little bit frisky, right? Particularly if they have companions, right? If they're in a family of stars, then some very interesting things begin to happen. Dangerous um, things? What kind of things? Well, for example, one of the one of the uh, things that one of the most violent uh, events in the universe, one of the most energetic events in the universe, among the most energetics, are things called Type One A supernovae, and these are enormous uh, stellar explosions. And the the core of the explosion is um, is is the model is a white dwarf. Um, now, a white dwarf is a star, but it's it's fairly compact. Um, it's sort of at its end of, of life phase where its, its core is not very active. Um, and, and so gravi gravity takes hold and crushes it down to a, a fairly small size. It still has the mass, still has the gravitational uh, pull, if you will, oh. uh, of a normal star. But when, that, when, when, when you have a binary pair, that is a, a pair of two stars, and one star goes into um, white dwarf phase. Um, sometimes what happens is the mass from the other star that when it goes into its, its giant phase, we should talk about, we actually should, should talk about um, leading up to becoming a white dwarf, but okay. uh, there's a phase of a star. Um, essentially, what is a star? Well, you've got this fusion core where you've got all this mass that wants to crush itself down to a, to a fairly compact body. And you've got fusion going in the core, which is which is radiate pushing outward. And the balance of the two things is the star. The surface we talk about surface of star being the spot where it goes from transparent, you can see through, to translucent, meaning you just see the see the surface and becomes opaque. Okay. Um, and there is something I want to address address from the uh, sure. chat, which is not on the topic of this, but it's a. Uh sort of uh, news around the kind of science education community, especially on YouTube and the internet in general. And that is, um, there has been some unfortunate health news about Bill Ludlow. Hmm. And I know that there has been some drama surrounding Bill Ludlow and we're not gonna, you know, we're not going to get into that right now because, um, there was just today a message on, um, uh, Bill's Facebook from his son posting on as Bill. Uh, and it turns out that Bill probably has on the order of days before he loses a battle with cancer. So, Poor dude. um, that's, that's sad. It is sad. And like I said, look, there's yeah. been, there, there's been some, some unpleasantness going around, but I think it's time to drop that. And you know what, whatever else Bill was a, big force for communication on evolution, human origins, um, uh, paleozoic paleontology. So yeah. Um, and actually, um, uh, Chesh, if you want a link, you're welcome to one. Um, I was, Ben was going to be on, but he is also ill, although not nearly as ill. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, if any of my mods can find, I think there's some kind of, GoFundMe or something for uh, Bill's uh, memorial or something like that. So if, if someone, one of my mods can find that or something, then they're wow. more than welcome to post that. Uh, or if someone can um, DM one of my mods or something, a link like that, that's just, that's something that's fine to go up there. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that that was something that happened. And uh, originally I had planned to say something about it at the beginning, but then I completely forgot about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, Ben, uh, you can send Chess the link because I sent you the link. It's in your Facebook. But um, so, okay, so now we have a star, and it's this balance between gravitational pressure pulling inwards and radiative pressure pushing outwards from all this fusion, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and um, you know, typically again, it's these these young stars. Are 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 going through the primary process is 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 hydrogen, you know, hydrogen converting hydrogen to helium. Although it's also typically a carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle. Pretty good if this is like a third population star. This is a sort of a third generation star, um, uh, like the ones that we 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 have around today. 
And um, so these stars go through their life. There's a, there's a process called, you know, we call it the main sequence, where stars uh, will start off um, fairly, you know, hot and blue. Right. They're, because um, um, they, 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 they pop at the of bubbles. They're, they're this, you have this gas, which is collapsing down to form a star. It re- gets enough pressure that fusion begins, that the fusion uh, quantum tunneling process begins. And, and the core um, um, event starts off, it pushes out, and, and the stuff that's fairly far away from the, the, the blob that's turning into a core um, gets pushed out by radiation pressure. But the stuff that's close enough for it to be gravitational bound to the core stays with it, and that becomes the star. And so those typical stars like our, our, our sun will, will radiate for somewhere on the order of around 10 billion years. But... Um, towards the end of that lifetime, when um, most of the hydrogen in the core has fused into helium, uh, the, 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 the hydrogen process begins to run out, basically begins to run out of fuel. And um, when it starts, when, when, when hydrogen isn't fusing as much, then there isn't as much radio pressure pushing out, gravity begins to win and starts to compact. And when it compacts, the pressure temperature in the core builds up and you start to get um, helium fusion, right? That helium starts fusing and starts getting, building up higher elements into things like carbon. Now, um, at this stage, the, the star goes into its giant phase where it'll basically puff up. And, and, and um, because the, the helium and those higher elements fuse that are more energetic, the, the, the core um, pushes out much more than the hydrogen core, hydrogen dominant core does. And that's when those stars swell up. And in the case of our star, uh, it follows along that main sequence um, towards the end of its lifetime, which is somewhere on the order of about you know, 6 billion years from now. Um, the, the sun will swell up to a size that will almost, or it's debated, almost get near the Earth's diameter in terms of its orbit. Um, so it will it'll expand quite a bit. Ironically, the, the, the temperature on the star cools um, when it does this, this bloating. Oh. Hurry. Oh, hey, Chesh oh, is here. Chesh. Hello. Always a pleasure to see you. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and You're not here, feeling you're... well? I am sick and gross. Everyone, you... send, send Chesh like ginger tea and chicken soup. Why would yes. you do that to me? I'm drinking beer. You don't have mm. to. You didn't have to click the join link. Cool. I, I'm here because I love you. Aww. And, and, and we, we appreciate you. So I'm Wait, starting off, by the way. You love Landon. I love you both. Oh. Very, very kind. Um, and it's also, and not to David, uh, I'm, I am having Quail's Gate Chardonnay from the Okanagan Ooh. Valley of British Columbia. Um, this is in sympathy for our friendly Canadians to the north um, who are going to go through a election thing on Monday. And uh, I wish them the best because, you know, elections sometimes can be interesting. <laughs> yes, they oh, can. Puff Alophagus. Puff is in the chat. Puff, can I quickly ask you a question? There's a Twitter out there right now that's sharing the GoFundMe for your dad. And they, I just want to confirm that that's actually your account because the way they jumped into a conversation made it look like it was the account of the other person in that conversation and that's i i just want to make sure that that's actually you and somebody isn't like using your father's funeral as like as a money-making scam well i don't think they're using it as a money-making scam but to like basically falsify their own twitter account oh so I just, yeah, it, it it looked like a fake account that was doing that. So if you can get back to me about if you have a Twitter and what that is, or because I this was under the impression that you don't have one, I can link it to you real quick in the chat. Well, he says, huh, so it sounds like it might not be for real, which is very annoying. Yeah, that's super douchey. All right, and they're probably yeah. So yeah. um, yeah. As people may or may not know, 
using other people's uh, suffering and tragedy for your own gain is one of my uh, things I don't like. I made a video about that. That that officially gets you qualified as a jerk. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't do stuff like this. Um, it's not okay. I'm I'm pulling I'm pulling the Twitter account and I'm just linking it. And if you can if you can verify that that is okay, that, if that is you, that would be fantastic. All right. So um, I, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, that's pretty no, no, crappy. No. But we do. There was a get back to stars. Sorry. Anyway, so we're talking about you know the fact that 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 star like the sun will um, start to run out of hydrogen, fusing hydrogen in its core. I mean, it won't completely run out of hydrogen in the core, but essentially it gets less, more and more helium, less less hydrogen. Um, at the temperatures that our sun's core is operating, helium doesn't fuse, right? It, right. It doesn't have it takes a lot much higher is. temperature for yeah. that, right? So, so when the when the hydrogen begins to run out, then the sun's gravity will start to to, to crush the sun down. The pressure and the density in the sieve will rise and it'll start to fuse hydrogen. And when, when helium fuses, it fuses as much more energetic and it pushes out the star and the star will blow it up from its, its rather nice sedate size up to almost, uh, almost uh, or possibly swallowing Earth um, at, at the time. It'll get, very, it'll get very hot. I mean, this will be global warming on a massive scale okay um, but that's in a few billion years though right yeah I'm... yeah 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 okay I, I, i'm just making a joke I just that's a long a time even for me yeah it's about six billion years so so again how how far how long has dinosaurs been around uh dinosaurs around? have been around since the end of the triassic period so we're around 160 ish million years it depends on exactly when you think the first dinosaur was around and that varies a little bit because at the when you get into the late Triassic, what is a dinosaur actually becomes a complicated question. There are some forms yeah. that there's some debate over. Is this really a dinosaur? Is it not? I, I, so I imagine I imagine you have a bunch of alphabet letters in terms of of, of who's a dinosaur and who's not. Oh and, yeah, yeah, and what and what dinosaur pronouns you're supposed to use. And to <laughs> um, yeah. So the big problem is because you know it's paleontology, so you can't use genetics to help out much because it's. I mean, genetic material is long gone. Mm -hmm. So the only thing we can do is look at uh, at anatomy. And <clears throat> you get to this period in the Triassic where these things, there are these things called dinosauromorphs. That they're pretty much dinosaurs, but they have these tiny little anatomical traits that don't quite fit into the normal definition. So there's a question as to whether or not some of these are dinosaurs or not. But uh, yeah, so even if we go back to the very dawn of dinosaurs, Five or six billion years is a very long time compared to that. So, um, yeah. all right. So now we have uh, what, what do we have now? A red giant. Yeah. So there, he, had, he had the he had the red giant. And again, we're talking about the, the the main sequence stars. We're not talking about really small mass stars like a you know half tenth of a mass of our star. We're not talking about things that are two or three times the mass of our star or really really big ones up to one fifty. We're talking about the ones that are sort of a common sort, sort of, of an uh, FGK type class star. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that in terms of, of those those in the, in their main sequence, the, right. they they tend to start out hotter and and ironically, actually, as they get bigger, they cool down. Um, even though the reaction is more radiative because the star is bigger, um, has more surface area. That same amount of that more heat has spread over even more volume, and okay. so these the the surface is cooler. So oftentimes you see these these giant stars, um, in their, their later bloated phase, are more reddish. For example, uh, one of the one of the famous uh, well, famous giants is is Antares, right? It's, and it's right. A, it's an example. Of but but I have for, to like Vy Canis Majoris. Yeah, because I like to go big or go home. Yeah, those those and so so we're not talking about those those really massive stars like that because they have a they have a whole different. Uh, 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 lifetime they're they're kind of they're kind of like the the ones that that they, they they burn hot they burn fast they have a short life and they go out with a spectacular bang oh like um, the guy from blade runner the replica yeah right? yeah okay. but but you know because our, our sun is going to be much more sedate it'll it'll blow it up towards its end you know it's, it's after it sort of has this midlife crisis and so like harrison ford cool and it builds up that 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 tire around around itself it'll it'll expand <laughs> up um, and certainly, uh, planets, uh, 
uh, Venus and Mercury will be swallowed up in, inside inside the sun. Um, it, it, it's hard to say whether the Earth's orbit will, will expand a little bit as a result, or the Earth will be near the, near the um, uh, edge and scheming the edge. Either way, for, for Earth, um, it'll probably be, you know, life will essentially be over on, on Earth by that phase. Uh, yeah, I, I would say will. probably before that. Yeah, and long, actually long before, but that's sort of like the, the end of spot. So if, if, the, the, if the star is not very massive, right? if, it's, if it's, let's say, less than um, you know, 1.4, 1 1.5 times the mass of our sun, um, once that, that helium phase burns quite quickly, it's only a few hundred million years um, before it, it consumes, because the helium will fuse at a much faster rate. That's why it's more, more energetic. That's why the star blows up. The fusion, when, when the helium fusion kind of runs out, then it begins to, to collapse again. And, okay. but, but here, uh, the, the stars like our sun, run out of options right because the the thing collapses and there and there is not enough mass enough pressure enough density to begin to fuse things like carbon and and, and silicon and that that race so what the center of the star does is kind of shrinks down to a a a, a pile of, of of atoms um and sits there very very hot very compact and okay. smolders for a long time. It's like it's like an ember out of your uh, uh, out of your uh, uh, barbecue, right? Right. It, it sits so, there and glows for a long time. So this radiation is just basically black body radiation that's giving out off, right? Yeah, pretty. I mean, they're they're pretty pretty efficient uh, radars of, of of heat. Now, if if it's like our sun, it'll uh, our sun's the, the white dwarf that our sun will will become. We'll just sit in space and radiate out for. You know, uh, for a trillions of years until it become quite hard to tell the difference between space and its surface, right? It'll just radiate heat, um, right? And then and goes. It'll goes. be a, a cold, dense ball. Yes. Now we um, have a quick question. Um, sure. Are brown dwarfs as volatile in terms of outbursts and radiation as red dwarfs are? And also, if those stars are almost purely hydrogen slash helium, and so uh, should they have nuclear fusion? So, so, um, uh, so brown dwarfs are, uh, you've probably heard of wet red dwarfs, right? Red mm -hmm. dwarfs are sort of, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of the, the easiest to spot, um, low mass stars. So stars that are, that are not very, very bright, not very, very hot. Well, even colder than, than red dwarfs are brown dwarfs. They're essentially, um, they're mostly radiating in the, in, in the infrared. Okay. Um, so they're kind of like your, your, your hot plate. It's not quite glowing red. It's kind of a little bit. Oh, you have a weak think, hot plate. Yeah, well. Get a better hot plate, man. Come if, on. If I talk <laughs> about when, when, when you turn it off and it's cooling down, right? <laughs> um, when it's in that, that phase. That's also the brown dwarfs. Now, um, red dwarf brown dwarfs are, are we've, we've observed some of them are actually somewhat um, uh, chaotic in their, their nature, right? That, that they're, it's, it's like, it's like the, the nuclear fusion is sputtering right? and, and it and it had outbursts where it'll start it's, it'll start to, to fuse more rapidly it'll push out on the core because it doesn't have enough mass and it'll extinguish itself and it'll collapse in and restart it goes back and forth back and forth sort of has these outbursts so there are classes of of red dwarfs that seem to have this kind of uh, bursty nature um this is important for people who are looking for um uh life around other stars um one of the nice one of the things to remember is that the the lower the mass of the star the longer it's going to live so um while our sun goes through it's 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 basic it's it's life cycle um in around 10 and a half billion years um a a star is as 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 maybe one tenth our mass of our sun um would be sort of red brown dwarf that thing can radiate for for several trillion years i mean it can okay. it gets really really long lived so one of the things that people thought was well maybe planets around those stars if the star radiates for a really long period of time has a really long time to evolve and do something interesting right and so maybe we should people say well we should look for these red dwarf brown dwarf because these stars live for so long right that 
Maybe. Even if life is unlikely there, it's got such a long time to get started that maybe yeah. that's a realistic possibility. Well, well, one of the things we've also seen, however, is that some of these some of these lower mass stars that are sputtering, it's like it's it's if the engine hasn't quite gotten to a nice revving cycle, and so it will begin to ignite in fusion, puff up a little bit. Basically, that that puffing up will will cause the um, core uh fusion rate just to go way down and then gravity will push it back in so so these these some of these red dwarfs are actually oscillating and sometimes they burst they, they have this sort of a spectacular can... burst and so it's presumed that some of those erratic uh, red dwarf stars might not be so nice to be around because they might have right. these radiation outbursts um brown dwarfs are even have even less fusion going on there is some fusion going on inside them that that's that's why they're still considered a star um there's a boundary line between when is it a brown dwarf and when it becomes a planet and we think that's that somewhere between about 13 times the mass of jupiter 13 to 70 somewhere around that range is <laughs> where small range huh it, it it and there's a debate about which and and, and various characteristics right. of those, but somewhere around that range is where it, it ceases to become a planet and begins to have enough fusion so you could call it a star but it's, okay. it's like dinosaurs right who was the first dinosaur what is a dinosaur right well now, at least <clears throat> while we can't necessarily know the answer we know that there is an answer that could hypothetically be uncovered because if you define dinosaur as a as a crown group you can say it's the common ancestor of the crown group and there yeah. must have been such a thing so at least in that case there is an objective right answer we just can't really get it yeah so, um, so, our, so of, that that boundary is is somewhere on there, but it's presumed that the brown dwarfs he's talking about, let's say the things are in the seventy to hundred times the Jupiter mass, um, maybe you know, up to maybe a, a tenth or two tenths of the mass of our sun, will have some fusion going on. It'll have some outbursts, but it won't be as bursty as, let's say, a red dwarf. That being said, then we started finding red dwarfs that are relatively stable. Okay, well, so, so you know, it, it's 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 nice to have these models, but then we start looking at the universe, you find okay, so now we want to know well, what makes these red dwarfs chaotic and these red dwarfs apparently stable? And are these stable ones do they turn chaotic back and forth, or is it some difference between them? Two? Okay, and we had a quick so, uh, question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I just want to update Puff real quick. Um, I tweeted it out with screenshots and let everybody know that it wasn't you what you'd said so hopefully that gets dealt with quickly and okay you don't have to worry about it yeah that's pretty crappy i'm i'm rather upset about that and that's not yeah, fun super time. douchey yeah don't don't use other people's deaths or health problems or things to try to pro make your own yeah yeah you will in your own lifetime have your own events and yeah. uh, you wouldn't appreciate if someone did that to you or what's worse is okay you may not like the person you're you think of doing this to but it's their family and friends that right live on after them that have to deal with yeah attack people's arguments don't attack and abuse abuse them as people as or people. especially yeah. their loved ones yeah yeah don't try and use loved ones as right. weapons against people that's that is completely fucking unacceptable and uh by the way hello to maya who's in here hi maya oh hi <laughs> sorry big fan and uh, um, Lynn, have you met Naya? met Maya? I can't even talk today. Have we met? Um, no. Okay. Okay. Maya. Oh, is... Hi, I'm I'm Landon. Hi, Maya. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know you. Everyone knows you. <laughs> You're the famous one there, Landon. <laughs> so um, we do have a question from Puffalopagus. Sure. Um, are a lot of the planets around red dwarfs typically tidally locked? Uh, I'm under the impression that they probably are, but I don't know that we actually have observations to confirm. Well, well, the tidal locking, which essentially is when when the um, one face of the planet typically faces mostly towards its parent body, such as our moon is tidally locked onto Earth. There's right. one face that essentially faces the Earth. And so what happens is that the, the planet's year becomes matches its day, right? It, it, right. Begins to to slow down and it's spinning, um, and eventually it basically gets to the point where it 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 turns around once 
while it rotates once, right? So the revolution and rotation of people become matching. Um, that happens over a long period of time. So one thing to say for red dwarfs that, 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 that are stellar for a long period of time is that they have a long time for their planets to hang around too. Right. And so they're much easier for those planets to become tidally locked. Um, this is, there's a whole big study being done on um, when do planets tidally lock and how fast do they tidally lock and why might some tidally lock faster than others. Um, it has to do, part of it has to do with how close the object is to the, uh, to the star. Um, and that's one of the things that's nice about, about red dwarfs and brown dwarfs is that, the, that, that even though those stars aren't very energetic, the planets can actually be in nice and close at a nice comfortable temperature, not super hot, super cold. Right. Um, there's a nice that nice zone there, and so those those planets can sit there, become tightly locked. Now that has a profound effect on your weather. If, for example, let's consider if the Earth would become tightly locked to the sun, we'd have one hemisphere pointing towards the sun, and it would get all the radiation heat. It would actually get quite hot. We'd have the other side, the back side, where it's night permanently, radiate heat. And so you'd have a super, super hot one side of the sun, but one side of the earth and a super cold other side. What would also happen to the atmosphere? Well, when it's hot, the atmosphere expands, right? So that atmosphere on that, that really hot side, we're talking about hotter, hotter, much, much, much hotter than the Sahara desert or the Gobi desert uh, can, can, can generate really, really high temperatures. Um, and so that atmosphere would boil up and, or, or puff up. Well, the cold side, the atmosphere contracts. You'd have these winds from the hot side going around the planet and sort of collecting on the cold side. Um, so you'd have a cold side that would be much, much, much colder than the deepest, darkest winters of, of, of Antarctica. And so you'd have this really kind of nasty situation of, of it's too hot on one side, too cold on the other side. You've got these violent winds. And you could kind of live around the edge of, right. the, of the planet. But one of the problems is that when it's tightly locked, it doesn't mean it's absolutely perfectly pointing at right. it. Right. It be kind some of wobbles vibration. back and forth, and depending on how much it mutates, how much it wobbles. Like our our moon, um, when you look at the moon, you can only see 180 degrees of its 360 degree circumference, circumference. But it wobbles about 10 degrees side to side over the course of a month. Right. It means you can't sit there right on the edge, and and it, that edge will, will keep it'll wobble around so it depends upon how uh, wobbly the, the the planet is um how how stable it is in its its huge centric lock stuff and also then at that point you also have potential outbursts to the stars so um i can get out tough out there it's yeah it's not that fun when you only have a one little ring you can live around and then periodically that ring gets bathed in harsh harsh radiation up into the x-ray spectrum yeah yeah. So um, let's go back to the case of, of, of the of the of the white dwarf, right? Right. That that, that, that cinder that was at radiate. Well, there is a there, there are many stars actually are not singletons like our star. They're actually come in pairs or in groups. Um, so binary star pair, two two stars um, orbiting each other, and and so what what happens is one star will go through its kind of giant phase and then shrink down and become a, a white dwarf. So you got this, you got this compact hot white dwarf orbiting its, 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 its other, you know, its companion, right? right. It's, 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 it's significant other, let's say <laughs> it that way. Sure. Um, and, um, but, but then that significant other goes into its giant phase, right? So it, it runs out of, of fuel in its center and it swells up. Well, when it swells up, you've got this compact, white dwarf object and material from the from the from the second parent star starts piling on to the white dwarf right it, it exactly it's it's outer envelope swells up so much that it's really easy for that stuff to spill over onto the other star so you start transferring mass from one one to the other well that doesn't go for very long before the the white dwarf reaches a a, a limit called the chandra shekhar limit when it's about 1.4 times the mass of our sun, something very interesting and very violent happens. Um, the, the hydrogen that's piling up on this on this white dwarf from the other, it's spilling over from the other companion, right? And it's because the other companion went to its 
exploded phase, it's piling up back onto the first white dwarf. That the hydrogen starts piling up deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, at the bottom, next to the 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 the, the core of, of the white dwarf, that hydrogen gets squeezed tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And then at some point it reaches fusion and bang, right? That the 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 that bottom layer it's so compressed that it begins to fuse. Well, what happens when it fuses? Well, it goes bang, right? Right, because now we have it pushes a up against the next layer of pressure. Well, that that next layer is now reaches the critical fusion thing, and so it goes bang, and and the whole thing basically gives you this runaway thermal nuclear explosion that that causes this white dwarf to do what's called a Type One A supernovae, and it emits an enormous amount of energy, and I mean an enormous amount of energy. Um, it it, it the, 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 the the numbers, you know, I could quote you the numbers, but they're sort of staggering. Right. Um, the best way I, I'd like to describe just how big, if if the sun could go type 1A supernova, it can't because it's too little mass, but if the sun did that, how bright would it be for someone on earth if you're watching this? And and uh, you go to a thought experiment, which is brighter, a, a type 1A supernova at the distance of the sun going off, or a one megaton hydrogen bomb right next to your eyeball. I'm going to go ahead and just guess the type 1A supernova. In fact, the type 1A supernova is over a billion times brighter oh. than that hydrogen bomb right next to your eye, right? Um, it's, it's an enormous amount of energy. These, 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 these type 1A supernovae explosions are so bright that they'll outshine the entire galaxy. Um, and you can you can we can see these things happen in very 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 remote galaxies where we right. can't even see the individual stars, but all of a sudden we see the flare up of one of these and this is, supernovae. And that's used as a standard candle, right? Because yes. the the energy range is very narrow for how much energy this, these things release. It's always about yes. the same amount, right? Yes, and and because yeah. it's, it's it's a physical process, right? It it you buy, pile up enough fuel, and when it reaches that critical fuel pile. Then it goes bang and it goes bang in, in a fairly standard way. Now there's some variations on that, and and those are more uh, get more esoterics on on the slight variations of things. But that's effectively um, and hi to unidentified Leviathan. He says hi to Landon too. So hello. So that's one of the reasons why white white dwarfs are actually you know pretty important. They right. are they are they're one of the ways that we've been able to get an idea about the the age in the universe, the size of the visible universe and so forth, these standard candles. Um, and that's how we, for example, discovered dark energy. Okay. Um, was, was through the fact that, that, that things were weird, right? Um, okay. Now, what is a white dwarf made of? I mean, the white dwarf is basically, um, uh, we call it basically electron. It's basically, um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, supported by electron degeneracy pressure, right? It's okay. essentially, it's a pile of atoms that are basically packed together um, in, in, a, in a fairly compact, dense form. And, and the density of, of a white dwarf is actually pretty, it, they're, 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 they're pretty dense object. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, water, right? And, and water, uh, a cubic meter, roughly a cubic yard, is around a thousand kilos, basically a ton. Right. Right? Um, take the densest uh, uh, element we know of, osmium, it, a meter that would be about 22 tons. If you look at the core of our sun, that's a pretty dense thing because it's hydrogen fusion. It's about um, 100 and, and it, it's around 150 um, thousand, you know, 150 tons per cubic meter, right? So it's much more denser than, 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 than osmium. A white dwarf dense. is around um, one million tons per cubic meter, right? It's 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 it is much much more denser than than the core, much more denser than so so um, you know a a you know it's 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 a billion kilograms per cubic meter. So it's roughly a million tons per cubic yard if you want if you're metrically challenged. Wow, um, it's dense, right? It's it's very very dense stuff. But it's all the atoms are basically the the gravity has pushed the atoms down 
to as close to each other as, 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 as they can. They still have electrons. Electrons are keeping the atoms from crushing each other, but, but the atoms are basically piled packed together. I'm going to have to take off. I'm You're sorry, leaving. guys. Aww, yeah. Bye. Have fun. Thanks for stopping by. Love you and guys. Hey, get better. Okay. I'll try. Well, if you don't get better, I'll I'll bug you about it or something. I don't know. Okay. okay. All right. Bye. Um. So I think, in the interest of time, we're probably gonna have to move on to neutron stars because I want to make sure we get through the mm. three main sort of uh, stellar remnants. So, um, what at what point is a star gonna turn into a neutron star? Um. That's typically you 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 get neutron star formation. Um, when they're when they're in um, several times the mass of our of our sun, um, one of the standard limits is that things that are stars that are beyond um, between about um, two to maybe around nine times the mass of our sun can become neutron stars. And what is a neutron star? Well, a neutron star is just a, a you think of it as just a giant atom, right? That that white dwarf with the atoms are together. If you keep pushing it harder and harder and harder, the 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 electrons will it'll the, the, the electrons of the atoms will be will be crushed and and the and the nuclear cores will go and and sink into a giant pile. Basically get you by basically get a, a neutron star in its in interior effectively is a giant pile of nucleus nucleuses. Um Whereas, whereas the white dwarf was um, a billion kilograms per cubic meter, um, a a neutron star is somewhere on the order of around a billion billion kilograms per cubic oh, meter. Oh, well, that's quite a bit more. Now, if you if you look at, you look at the density of of an atom inside, density of the atom is around two point seven times ten to the seventeenth kilograms per cubic meter in, in terms of talk about inside an atom, right? Most of the atom is atoms are not that massive because most of the atom is just empty space. Right. But when you crash all the nuclei together and get a giant pile of them, then you get a neutron star core. And and the, the numbers range is about a factor of 10 range, but they're somewhere on the order around 10 to the seventh, 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. And at this point, the density just becomes so there they're dense. That's about all you can really say. Um, and so, so these neutron stars. I just got a notification that I didn't know was a thing, saying oh. that uh, we're gonna the meeting will end in ten minutes unless I upgrade. Apparently, that's a thing Zoom does. Is that a thing? I don't know. Well, if that happens, I will apologize to everyone and send out another link because I can't upgrade right now if I wanted to. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so essentially, the the mass of neutron stars, actually, I should say the 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 the, the neutron star masses um, start with a star somewhere between ten to maybe twenty nine solar masses. Okay. And when it goes supernova, when 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 remember, in our sun, we went the hydrogen to the helium phase, we blew it up, and then it kind of shrunk down to 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 a. Um, to a white dwarf core. Well, a a more massive star has enough, you know, ability to crush that 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 helium when it runs out to start fusing carbon and fusing. Then it starts to fuse silicon, um, and then it starts to fuse iron. But but one of the things that happens when you get to iron, you know, bigger and bigger atoms got get formed. Is that iron when it fuses no longer gives off positive energy, actually takes energy. It goes from an exothermic reaction that gives off energy to an endothermic reaction that, that, that consumes energy. So when you get to the point where the where the star starts to fuse iron, instead of that iron reaction giving off energy, it starts to consume energy. So gravity just takes and collapses the star down, keeps crushing, 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 crushing. And now, um, when it does so, it'll blow off its outer layers. So that 10 to 27 solar masses um, tend to blow off, and what you get in the interior core is, is the neutron, piles of atoms that, that are basically have been crushed together. And it's a very, very compact object. Um, they're maybe only like 10 kilometers in diameter. So they're, they're tiny things. Um, right. But you've taken a star 
that's that's much more massive than the sun and have crushed it down to something that's that's relatively nice, like a, a mountain or so yeah and and so it is it has really really weird um um effects uh, because now you basically have just a giant nucleon you have all these weird charges running over the surface of, of the thing so it gets you get these enormous magnetic fields you get very very high spin rates because there's a spin rate of a, of a of a normal star maybe in terms of days that it spins around but when you come squeeze it down to something like 10 kilometers it starts spinning faster and faster and faster right so you get some very very fast spinning um, objects and that's what a pulsar is essentially right yeah, a pulsar is where we can see the effect of the spin of the neutron star. Um, the, the 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 neutron stars tend to have tend to able to have these enormous magnetic fields and tend to radiate material out their out their um, their, their poles. They don't perfectly. So here's a neutron star, um, and and let's say this is the spin axis you see here. Um, mm -hmm. They don't perfectly uh, 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 spin on their axis. They they might their their physical spin here might be offset from their center of mass, and so they end up wobbling like this, or precessing. Well, remember that that the neutron star has jets of stuff coming out its north and south poles. Okay. So if you're the Earth, right? You're watching there, and the neutron star is spinning off axis like this. You see a blink. Because now the, the now the beam is pointing towards you, and it comes away, and you see another blink here. So basically, you see a blink twice times when the thing spins around. Now it doesn't have to be on its axis like this; it can be off to the side, and still you still get these sort of of lighthouse blink type things. And right. so we see the pulses of of light, the flickers of light from the stuff this rapidly spinning pile of atoms, right? It, it, it's it's a pile of nuclei. It's no longer just atoms; it's a pile of nuclei. That is, that is that is that is you know billion times more dense than the white dwarf. Okay. And and it has enormous magnetic fields. Um, it radiates all kinds of stuff. It's it's they're, they're pretty exotic stuff. So, um, I am having a Q and A question towards the end, but a question did just come in that I think is probably relevant right now, which is, um, what do you think about the hypothetical existence of quark stars or strange stars? Well, that's been a question about 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 you know the fact that that what when 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 you get to really massive neutron stars, what happens, right? And and at some stage, if they get too massive, then they form a black hole and you can't see them anymore. But but things that are not quite black hole, um, but are more aggressive neutron stars, what might be in the center of them? Um, is it is it truly just nucleons, you know, neutrons that are basically packed together? Or is there some strange state of matter that's even denser at it at its core um, that could be, you know, uh, you know, cork soups and other other strange things? The most of the thing is you don't worry about our sun because because the, the generally it's accepted that only stars around eight times the mass of our sun can become neutron stars. There's a range. Some that can be smaller. Some can be bigger. Um, the original parent star might be like five or six to maybe you know, 20 or 30 times the mass of our sun. But generally eight is kind of the, the limit that if you're if your star is eight times the mass of our sun, then most likely you're not going to form a white dwarf. They're going to have this violent collapse. A supernova will occur when that happens. It's called a type two supernova. And we, we notice these these bright flashes. There's these one type that are the white dwarf where it piles up hydrogen from the companion and goes bang. There's other type where massive star collapses. No, I would expect are, brightness for type two supernovae to, to vary much more in terms of intrinsic brightness, correct? Yes, and, and and properties and what it does. Most of the heavy elements that are heavier than uh, lithium, or even heavier than the maybe oxygen, are formed by these type of supernovae. So, everyone in the chat, thank supernovas for your existence. Because it wouldn't be possible without them. Yes. So, so you know, most of you know, the, the 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 iron, nickel, copper, zinc, those type of 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 of, of your elements, even radium, those are things that are formed as a result of supernovae. And right there, there's type two supernovae, there's type one B, there's type one C. There's a bunch of variants of, of stuff, but but essentially, that's kind of the, the kind of the two, um, the two kind of uh, several death nails. The 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 normal, the small star that just kind of 
quivers and, and, and goes down a nice, you know, cool blob. The, the sunlight star that floats up at the end of its phase and pushes down to a nice compact white dwarf. The white right dwarfs that are near other stars where their, their material piles onto them, and they go bang like a cyclone A supernovae. The ones that are around eight times the mass um, that can form a neutron star where they have this type two supernovae blows off materials. The sound waves that generates from, from those things are some of the, the most energetic reactions that we know of in the universe. And the compact objects that are sent, literally a pile of nuclei um, have enormous magnetic fields and do all kinds of crazy stuff with their nebula. But one of the things that those supernovas do is they push out a lot, they form heavy elements. Um, so, but things like, you know, the, the stuff that's, 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 that the calcium in your bones, the, the iron in your blood, those are, those are atoms that were formed during a supernova, during a, a death of, of a massive star. And one of the things those, those explosions do is push out into space. So that those heavy elements get flung out of space at enormous speeds. And they travel around. We see these, you know, so we see these nice nebulae with these nice glowing stuff that's that's expanding. Like the out. planetary nebulae? Yeah. I and, saw some of those uh, last weekend. Oh, excellent. Where did you see yeah. them? I was at um the Sky Center for that is uh, run by the University of Arizona on Mount Lemon near Tucson. They yep. have um, what, to my understanding, is the largest um, reflecting telescope available for public use at a on a kind of rental basis, basically. And so they do stargazing nights, provided you know, provided the weather is accommodating. Sure. And so it's a, uh, I believe it's a forty-inch primary reflector on that telescope, which is enough that you can look at some nearby planetary nebulae. So we looked oh. at the uh, the Dumbbell Nebula and the Ring Nebula. And uh, we saw every planet in the telescope except Mars and Earth, because the telescope doesn't point at Earth, and why would you want it to? Yeah, well, and you Mars can, you kind of, I mean, when, when we're at Fremont Peak, which is, which is a 30-inch, um, we point it down at the, at the you know, the horizon, say there's Earth. Wow. Um, <laughs> and, and at 30 inches as well, Pluto shows up. You can see a little bit of discoloration, right? That Pluto doesn't seem, doesn't, it, 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 in the star field it's in, you could tell it's a, it's a slightly off, off, off white uh, color, which is also kind of nice. Um, so I say, so those, those, those neutron stars, um, are, are, are pretty interesting. So, um, I guess we're going to get to the point where. Oh, yep. That was it. I'm going to resend an invitation. Cause I don't know why that just happened. Cause, uh, zoom apparently is less cool than I thought. So give me a second. Yeah, I did basically answer all of the questions in, um, at, at the. Um, call it at the um base center. So I'm gonna resend to Landon. There's Landon, and I'm gonna probably have to open up Facebook, which I try to keep closed during streams, but whatever. Here's one for Maya. Maya. There you go. So speaking of supernovae. <laughs> <laughs> Just jumping right in. I like it. So uh yeah, that those 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 uh neutron stars are pretty interesting. They're, they're they have enormous gravitational uh you know uh, uh the gravity there is a uh, surface is very strong. I mean they're typically like uh somewhere around hundred billion times uh the surface gravity of Earth. Because they're, they're they're massive compact stuff, so the escape velocity off of neutron stars are typically you know a, a reasonable fraction of the speed of light. They're not speed of light because then they'd be a black hole, but right. Typically, um, typical escape velocity speeds on a neutron star is somewhere in the order of between maybe a third to a half the speed of light. They're they're enormous compact objects, but. Again, the, the formation of the neutron stars, the death, all that other material. Because remember, if you have a star that's around eight times the mass of the sun, that's turned into a neutron star, neutron star that may be somewhere on the four or five, but it started off with maybe 20 or 30 times the mass of the sun. All the other material is sort of blasted out in space. And also the, the, the shock waves that occur. Welcome um, back, Maya. Oh, welcome back, Maya. <clears throat> so the shockwaves that occur that that fuse this this really you know, these these very heavy elements in that last moments of of the star you know, in its in its last death throes, um, 
seed the, the universe with these heavy materials. Now, shockwaves, by the way, travel in space. They hit a they hit a nice hydrogen cloud that's basically kind of warm, but just basically managing its own business. All of a sudden, it gets hit with this shockwave wall, and that shockwave wall creates um, a, a, a dense pressure boundary. Okay. Well, what happens? We have dense stuff. Well, you have more gravitational mass, and so that that dense little lob that that gets hit starts to attract other hydrogen, and so hydrogen starts piling up around those little nodules, and you get a new star form. So it's quite the case that you'll see uh, a, a a massive star will live for only maybe a few hundred million years. It will go bang, let's say, a type two supernovae, and around that shock wave. Around the area will start to form little small stars. Okay, that'll be perhaps more sedate. So much like a redwood, the parent redwood dies, and you get a ring of other redwood from there. Well, the, the the parent star dies, and and it seeds these next generation stars with heavy stuff that ends up making the planets. Okay. So when you look at a planetary system of a new star with new planets around it. The, the, the planets are from the basically the senders of the previous planets, previous stars um, 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 explosion. In the case, the model that we have for our solar system was that there were two supernovae, one about 4.8 billion years ago, one about 4.7 billion years ago. The 4.8 billion years ago star went bang. It, it caused the cloud that our sun formed in to collapse a little bit. And as it was kind of collapsing and getting warm, um, 100 million years later, another supernova shockwave hit it. And that, we were already kind of had a dense nodule. That meant the second wave of stuff really stuck. And so we had a nice, generous dose of heavy stuff, rocky stuff, metal stuff. Okay. Which most of us are, are, are made of. So we can't just think one supernova. We have to think two. Yeah, because because the supernovae kind of have a mix. They have, they have kind of a, of a of a curve of nucleon depending on on their characteristics, and we see an Earth isotope mix a bimodal distribution, and so the assumption is that we had two supernovae that occurred. Okay, and given the given the decay rates of of of, of radioactive material, we can pin the one event about four point eight billion years ago, and the other about four point seven billion years ago. All right. Now, I know it's not quite the Q&A time, but Maya. Sir. What is, what is the big, one big question you always wanted to know about neutron stars, but you never, you never really got up the courage to ask? <laughs> uh, Come on. You got to have something for me. Didn't, why do astronomers consider everything beyond carbon to be a metal? <laughs> Stealing ah. Puffalophagus's question. I get it. That's okay. <laughs> well, no, fair, fair, fair question. I mean, um, it's kind of it really is comes down to the processes involved. So the, the 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 models, for example, of how the what what happened to Big Bang, said that at that time, hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium was what's formed out of the primordial Big Bang process. Right. Um, it wasn't until you had lumps of hydrogen that were dense enough to form stars that you had it some 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 some, if you will, mini bangs, right? There was a period of time we called the Dark Ages, where after the 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 plasma cooled and you had ne neutral hydrogen, there was really there was nothing making light, right? And so somewhere in the several hundred million years after the Big Bang, um, there weren't stars. Now the de age is is debated, but it might be somewhere on three hundred million years might be a safe bet to say that it wasn't until some. Three million years later, they had enough stuff down that the first stars that formed um, began to switch on. Okay. Now the stars that formed form out of what? Mostly hydrogen. You know, uh, it, it, it numbers. You know, that I, I, there's mostly hydrogen, a, a good chunk of helium, and a little trace of lithium. That's it. That was it. There wasn't. There wasn't anything really bigger than helium, the third lightest element in, in the universe. It wasn't until those early massive stars had their short life and went supernova bang that you could form anything beyond lithium. So when, 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 when astronomers call them at a metal, they're not talking about it in a chemistry sort of thing. They're really saying there's the primordial stuff, hydrogen, 
helium, a little bit of lithium, and there's everything else. Everything else comes from all those deaths of the stars. Okay. And as a reminder to the chat, um, if you have a question that refers to exactly what we're talking about right now, I may ask it if I think it fits into the flow. But we are going to have a Q&A section right after we talk about uh, black holes, which I think we should probably do pretty soon. Yeah. Um, so, so I mentioned, mentioned just finish, finishing up with with the with right. the neutron star. So you had the star typically around eight times the solar mass or bigger collapses. Um, the neutron star that it forms is somewhere between 1.1 times the mass of our sun to about maybe 2.1. Um, there's there are there are possibilities between two and five solar mass neutron stars. That's where those you get those quark stars, electroweak stars. Those are stars that are almost black holes, but not quite. Um, and those are weird in them themselves. We don't know if they even really exist, but but we have good evidence they might. Okay. Um, so so the question becomes: Well, what happened if you had a thirty mass star that that turned into a neutron star that was only two masses? What where did the twenty eight stuff? Where do those twenty eight solar masses go into? Well, they came oh, into the universe, flashed out in the universe. Some fraction of that are heavy elements, what it's what astronomers call metals, that end up sticking around new, newly formed planetary systems. So it's the tree falling in the forest that collapses, tears open a hole that that its nutrients seed the, the, the surrounding environment, and you have new trees sprouting up. You know, that the death of a big giant turns into a new, you know, a, a explosion of of, uh, of of life elsewhere. And that's what we see in the case of these these massive stars. Okay. That's what we see the first population of stars that went bang, created the material. So we would not expect if their model is correct, to find planets around the first population stars. You'd only find planets around the second population stars. And even then, those won't be as good because the second population stars um, uh, don't have much in the way of, of they're kind of anemic in their heavy elements. The third population stars are more like our sun. We get a nice mix. So okay. you have to have a couple of generations before you get a good mix of all this stuff that's considered your metals. Okay. But again, they're normal stuff. I mean, temperatures on the order of like a, a trillion degrees um, on the on the surface. And by the time you talk about trillion degrees, it doesn't matter if it's Kelvin or Celsius. It's it's hot. Yeah, it's really really big. Now, um, so I know that <clears throat> the idea is that over enough trillions and trillions of years, uh, white dwarfs are going to hit essentially, you know, thermal equilibrium with the surrounding space, and they'll just... yeah, they'll cool down and just be a a, a, a right. A, a, Basically, a, a a cold, a black dwarf, right? Now, suppose or presumably, the same thing would happen to a neutron star, right? Yes. Um, one thing is also the neutron stars um, spin down. They they might start off life spinning maybe a thousand times a second, right? Where the edge of the neutron star is spinning at a reasonable fraction of the speed of light, but they begin to slow down. Part is because there's the, that that magnetic field gets dragged in by all that that surrounding nebula that that they created. And it kind of the, the, it radiates, um, you know, the, the basically the, you get you get back forces and 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 electromagnetic radiation, and they basically start to spin down, so that after a while they can slow and slower and slower, and they'll become less and less um, uh, uh, energetic uh, as they as they spin slower and 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 begin to cool off. But they take a lot longer to cool off, um, except of course sometimes neutron stars find other find other neutron stars. Well, and we then find we get gravity you get waves. these bursts of stars that form. So you might have a, a cluster. You look at like the Pleiades, that, that nice cluster of stars up in the sky. Um, those are stars that formed at about the same time. And when some of those go bang, um, they'll go bang, 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 bang in, in relatively near succession. And so you'll have a bunch of these potential neutron stars sitting around and they have a chance to go and merge. And when neutron stars merge, Lots of weird physics happen, including sometimes pairs of neutron stars form a black hole. Okay. Um, and so, you so weird stuff happens. <clears throat> so sometimes black holes are dead stars, and other times they're dead, dead stars. Yeah, and, and sometimes there also could be material that never actually formed stars. It just, um, it just collected 
out rapidly and formed a black hole without even forming a star. Straight to black hole. Yeah, because all all black hole is is really dense material. Right. It's there's nothing, you know, um, super magical, right? It, 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 you don't have the magical material to form a black hole. You just have a lot of stuff in a very complex area. Well, unless and, it has a mouth and eyes like the black hole on the thumbnail for this video, uh, that sure. might be magical. Sure. Which, by the way, uh, yes, that was actually a ghastly face from Pokemon. That's the, the ghastly Pokemon, which is a ghost mm -hmm. type. I thought was appropriate to slap that on a black hole. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I think we should go to uh, black holes. So black hole is one of the other fates that a star can end up in, although we've already discussed that that's not necessarily how all of them start. Yeah. But I would say that there is a... Perhaps you could call it a class of black holes that start off as as stars. Yeah, the stellar mass black holes, um, things that are probably, you know, well, the really massive stars, certainly nine times the mass of our sun or, or much better, have a chance of forming a black hole. Now, it depends upon how the star collapses. One of the things we think is that that if, if you got something, let's say nine times the mass of our sun, and it collapses uniformly down to the center, um, and and it doesn't bounce, right? So you don't have a shock wave that causes it to lodge to, to 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 lose its mass when, as it's collapsing. Um, then you can get a very compact object, and all it is is an area where the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. According to relativity, um, nothing you you can't nothing can travel faster. No mass can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, so until we have convert an... the polarity of the tachyon field. Yeah, well, yes. And 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 if you can explain how to do that, I'd be able to, <laughs> to find we'll out. We'll just have to ask the fourth doctor. No, sorry, the third doctor. He'll know all about that. Sure. Because that was his so, catchphrase. Just reverse the polarity. So so the thing is that that what is where is the what is a black hole? It's the, it's it's this region in space where the gravitational field is so strong that you'd have to go faster than the speed of light to escape it. And so it's it's the area, it's the point of no return. Um, inside is a compact object that is a gravitational field. There's a compact material inside it, and it's got a just normal gravitational field. So the edge of a black hole is the point of return where the state velocity is, requires you to go faster than the speed of light. You can't, so you can't escape. Except you can, but, but that's a... Well, we'll, that's, we'll talk more about black holes. Well, that, that gets into the whole... So we've talked about the ultimate fate of white dwarfs and neutron stars, which is essentially that they will kind of cool off over absurdly yeah. long periods of time because <clears throat> they're basically so neutron stars are giving off a lot of electromagnetic radiation through um internal magnetic fields and things like that right yeah but presumably, as, well as, as well as the radiating black body radiation as well I mean, right they're, they're i was gonna say presumably there's also black body radiation going on yeah. and a white dwarf is essentially all just black body radiation yeah but given the ridiculously high starting temperatures and densities that we're starting with it's going to be a very it long takes a, time. It takes a very, very long time. Right. Um, now, black so, holes don't do that, though, do they? No. No. And so so when you get to black hole phase, now this radiate, you have a problem of, of the object radiating um, uh, material. And so on, the, on, on sort of the zeroth level of stuff, you can say, well, what goes into black hole doesn't come out, except there's, a, there's, there's, there's quantum mechanics. And um, quantum, quantum mechanics, mechanics says, ruin it always, everything for everyone. Yeah, this is, this is the thing that Hawking um, talked about is how um, black holes can emit Hawking radiation. Um, and uh, it's a process by which, due to the uh, quantum field theory and curved spacetime, how that works, um, stuff can leak out of the black hole. Um, and, and so that's a case where, where black holes aren't really black. They do radiate a little bit over time, but but enormous amount of time before they will go. The, the smaller the black hole, ironically, the smaller the black hole, the shorter its time length is. So okay. really small black holes that can be on the order of Earth in mass right. will radiate very you know, quickly and, 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 and decay away in the order of, of thousands of millions of years. And that's one of those and, reasons why we probably shouldn't be too scared about the possibility of uh, particle accelerators making miniature black holes because they'll have a lifespan of a few what picoseconds or even much much less than that i mean the, the, the type of things that you would get in an atomic reaction 
those black holes will not live long enough for even light to enter into them, right? Okay. They're, 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 they'd radiate, they radiate so fast that you, light couldn't even cross the boundary, right, to, to get to them. You, it, there's nothing, they can't suck in anything with this. They decay away before anything can even go into their, right. their, their, their fields. Um, so small, so we think in the case of, of uh, you know, of black holes, that black holes on the size of, you know, size of mountains, like a, like a Mount Everest mass black hole, um, that was created in the moments of the Big Bang have long since radiated away. And ones that are planetary size are going to radiate a go away in the order of, of, of billions of years to trillions of years, depending on how fast they are. Um, when you get to sort of stellar sized black holes, then they're going to last for, for enormous, you know, enormous amount of time. And um, it, it's, it's ironically that, that, that the more massive the black hole, the, the longer it's going to, going to, to last. Okay. So <clears throat> what I'm getting at is, or what I'm getting from this is that eventually the universe is going to be a whole lot of really cold things slowly evaporating. Yes. And, 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 you know, thermodynamics is that the universe will come into basically sort of a, a an equilibrium. Um, somewhere on the order around 10 to the hundredth power. There's, there's one with a hundred zeros by that time, almost all the black holes, the, the big mass of black holes in the center of galaxies will have decayed away and the universe will just be a, a bland loop of, of energy um, where there's not really, I will possibly do work because energy is basically relatively uniformly distributed. There's no lumps of things or nothing to get energetic. Okay. And so you'll get a fairly boring I feel like, universe. And this is, this is heat death of the universe. We think. Okay. But there might be other problems, right? Because okay. we, we don't quite know, we don't quite understand dark energy. We don't know what its role is going to be in this whole thing. Okay. So, Well, if let's presume there is a heat death, in which case I think someone in the chat should write and record a metal song called Heat Death about the heat death of the universe. So someone yes. in chat, get on that. That seems to be very, that'd be sort of like an, an emo type of song. Maybe it could be that too. Type. I say it should be a metal song, and then someone in the chat should should just go do that. Oh, it's already written. Problem solved. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, haven't we recently detected black holes merging? Isn't that a thing? Yeah. So, so that's been an exciting thing that that gravitational gravitational waves, not gravity waves, but gravitational waves, are things predicted again by by Einstein, where massive objects moving. Um, radiate you know gravitational gravitational waves right and um massive stars moving very rapidly create lots of it so what what we've been able to observe is gravitational waves coming from black holes merging with each other we've even seen what we think is is a pair of neutron stars that 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 merge together as as well so these are enormous um you know events that radiate lots of, of radiation in the form of gravitational waves um, and cause essentially the fabric of space, the grids of space to sort of have space quakes, right? So we have, we have what these things like LIGO are doing is they're detecting um, quakes in the fabric of space when these massive objects slam into each other. And um, they basically, so you've, got, you've got two objects and they start to spiral in towards each other and, just, and speed up and zip and, and merge. And um, the resulting that last little zip and merge gener normally generates enormous amount of gravitational um, wave energy that okay. can be detected by very careful instruments um, here on Earth. Okay. Well, I think we've ha been having a lot of questions, and I'm I'm trying not to make it too much that you know we we interrupt the flow of this for that, but I think it might be a good time unless you have yeah. Something... I mean, we've, we've gone we've gone through sort of the the, the, the sort of the phase of some of the stuff, okay. and again there there are there are our magnetars and there are our other exotic objects that are out there, but we've kind of gone through essentially the fate of of most right. of the universe. So now we know not only how the stars are likely to die, but how the universe is likely to die. 
Well, uh, we have we have a model for that now. Right. The big the big problem with the fate of the universe is that we don't know understand as much about something called dark energy right. and its role in in the things, and that's we're, we're trying to figure that out. Those are important questions that cosmologists are trying to uh, trying to figure out. Maybe the, a dead universe can be the Halloween stream for next year. Yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's definitely. I mean, that seems more like a. a a dead universe sounds like a punk band. It does. Maybe okay. Good band name. If you're out there and you want to make a punk band, consider Dead Universe. <laughs> so <clears throat> now let's get some questions in. Um, I know there have been a lot of questions that were asked uh, in the chat that I didn't ask yet. So dump them in, and um, because we need to hear Maya's lovely voice, I I nominate Maya to read questions. But Maya, do you have any questions on, on too. life, the universe, and everything? Um, I don't have answers, but <laughs> no, <laughs> not all of them. I might have some. No, because he was like, do you have any questions on stars? And I'm like, no, like stars are kind of the devil we know. Um, the things that I have questions about are always, you know, um, kind of the before the beginning. Um, how does dark energy match? Um, or dark matter, how does it, like, because we know, we, I say no, but like there are sections of the universe where we're like, okay, that has to be what's working as opposed to, let's say our solar system where we say there's none. Yeah. And so can you kind of explain like okay. how we know yeah. what So, so um, as you alluded to, when you're talking about metal saying, how could something like oxygen be a metal for an astronomer? Yeah, that was totally my we, we sometimes are name challenged on on things, and and mm -hmm. and here's a case of you've heard something called dark energy, you've heard something called dark matter, mm -hmm. um, and 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 if you're if you're rational, you'd say, well, energy matter you know, e equals mc squared. I mean, you can you can go back and forth between dark energy and dark matter. Well, no, they're actually two different things. Um, it's kind of unfortunate names for for them. So let me describe what we know what's called dark matter is. Um, there is a gravitational field that we observe and we can measure the gravitational field. That's what we know. Um, the question is, well, they say, well, where's that, what is that gravitational field from? And the normal thing you'd say is, well, something has mass, it has a gravitational field. So there must be mass out there. And so people are looking for that missing mass. Well, um, in fact, Zwicky was a, a famous, uh, interesting character at Caltech, who was one of the first people, a physicist, basically saying to astronomers, hey, you know, you got a problem here, right? Because if I go in and look at a bunch of galaxies orbiting each other, and I can calculate the mass, they're orbiting so fast, they're spinning so fast, that they should be flying apart. But they're not. Viral galaxies that, that spin around, spin around much faster than, than the stuff you'd expect you could see all the stars. So why aren't spiral galaxies flinging apart? Um, the answer is there's a gravitational field there that's holding it together. What causes that gravitational field? Well, that's what we call dark matter because we think matter, that, that, that's the way gravitational field is. You just don't have gravity because it decides to go out for Sunday brunch. Um, it, it's, it's got to have something there. The problem is we've never been able to observe this stuff that's creating this gravitational field. And, and in the universe, when you measure the normal stuff, I'm talking about all the particles, photons, lights, uh, neutrinos, all the exotic stuff you see, accelerators, as well as normal matter and, and so forth, that's about 4% of the universe. There's about 24% of the universe that, that, that's, that is generating this excess gravitational field. So we assume it's stuff that has mass. Well, what is it? Well, the problem is we can't see it. That's why, we, that's why they call it dark matter. By not seeing it, I mean, we've never been able to see this dark matter radiate anything from, from, from long radio waves all the way up to gamma waves. It's, it's basically, it's, it's, it's not glowing. Any it's light reflecting. whatsoever um, that we can detect. Um, it's not absorbing light, right? So, so, so stuff that passes through 
a dark matter field, we don't see, you know, colors being absorbed and it doesn't reflect. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't reflect, it doesn't absorb, it doesn't radiate, it appears to a light of anything. Now, maybe it does, it's very, 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 very weak, but astronomers are really good at detecting really faint stuff. And the fact we haven't seen anything coming from this dark matter stuff says, well, okay, it, it may be it's stuff which doesn't interact with light, right? It's some exotic thingy. Is there any way it could be a problem in like our physics or like the math? Yes, because some people say, well, maybe gravity over scales, large scales, like right. the size of a galaxy or galaxy clusters, um, behaves different. Now, it's not that it says, oh, if it's greater than this, then do this weird thing. There well, may I mean, be. Yeah, we have to have a different, you know, we use string theory for black holes as opposed to like, you know, relativity for, again, our solar system. So, so the standard Newtonian G, M1, M2, or R squared, that, right. that may be incomplete. There may be a plus a something else. Exactly. And something else for normal things on the size of our solar system is so tiny that we can't really detect it. Um, and so this is called mod modified Newtonian um, uh, dynamics. Um, the problem is that, that we've gotten really good at detecting gravity. We've de got very good at detecting um, these you know, um, sets of stuff and motions of materials, so forth. And, and for something to behave where gravity has these extra terms, I would have to be really, one, why those extra terms? And secondly, the, the constraints we have on the scale of our solar system and so we can have a really good idea what's going on. We don't detect, we don't detect anything that's kind of anomaly. We don't, it's not, um, even stuff we thought about the Pioneer spacecraft or Voyager spacecraft deviating a little bit, we've learned to say, oh yeah, it's this, this, and this. We've explained that stuff. So, so it's got to behave six times more energetic at the scale of galaxies or galaxy clusters and be totally untraceable at, at the solar system level. That's weird. I'm not saying it's possible, but it's weird. So, so the, the thought about dark matter, this excess gravity being a thing, is something we were taking seriously, but the problem is that that, that would have been a nice, easy, oh yes, gravity has this other term and, and it's more to it than this. Um, it, it's it's not looking good for that that process. And wasn't there um, recently an observation of a galaxy where the amount of gravity was actually what would be predicted based on solely the visible matter, meaning it simply seemed to have less dark matter than normal? Yeah, I mean, that, which so, so, would so indicate the, that dark matter is a thing and not a variation on how we understand gravity. Yes, because we've seen dwarf galaxies, you know, tiny, tiny galaxies that have dark, dark matter gravitational fields at a at hundred times the, 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 the strength of the normal matter, right? So we've seen one that outlier and presumably you also see stuff that's, that's almost none. The bullet cluster, uh, two clusters of galaxies that, that pass through each other, um, stripped each other of a lot of, 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 of the material between the galaxies. Um, but but they're, they're a case where we can sort of measure again, the density of this gravitational field. And, and again, um, we don't know, right? That, 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 this, is, this is an important understanding about, about science. Science is about questions. So your, Maya, your question about what is dark matter is science. That's, 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 that's in fact, we get really excited when we don't know something because all this I'm talking about of, of black holes and right towards so forth, those are things. Yeah, those, that's sort of like stuff we know. What we get really excited about is what is this dark matter? Right. Why is it there? Why can't we detect bits of dark matter here on Earth, right? And 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 what's the nature of it? And and what will it do? Those are big questions. And that's you know, science is about asking questions. It's not about giving answers. All right. I want to make sure that we so get your question more... is actually a really important, really hot topic. And I want to make sure we get to a few more questions because we okay. are. Sorry. Coming up at the point where now, if we if we continue to give twenty minute answers, we will not get to very many questions. Oh, I'm sorry, but she answers a great question. <laughs> it is a great know, question. No, Thank so, you. Um, but no, yeah, the chat. They there was public okay, short, asked, short answers. 
several times, um, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because I, I'm having a little bit trouble pulling it right back up. But um, and apparently, uh, Zoom is complaining about this again, so I'm probably not going to keep using Zoom unless I upgrade. Maybe that's what happened to us, Maya. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, <clears throat> uh, Puffleupagus asked, so we can detect rogue stars between galaxies, and we have, um, we're fairly confident that there are rogue planets in galaxies, and I guess presumably between them. No, we, we, we've actually detected rogue planets okay. now. Okay. So, his question is, um, what are the odds that there are black holes that are rogue black holes? And if there are any, how could we detect them before, say, they maybe entered a galaxy? Well, um, those those rogue black holes, um, we would detect them because even even between galaxies, there it's not complete vacuum. There's stuff there. Right. We would see material falling into those black holes, and even though it might not be bright, there the, the the energy that spirals into the black hole when it's spiraling down the drain, that material gets very very hot and radiates. So we would see that radiation in the X-ray and gamma rays, right? And that's one of the reasons we can we can detect these black holes in the centers of these many galaxies. When you do a, a an X-ray or gamma ray telescope that's got really fine resolution, you find these little gamma ray dots in centers of galaxies because that's where the black holes tend to congregate. Um, there are dots that are, aren't associated with galaxies, um, and so we again, may those have are ejected black holes. Black holes. Yeah, and so we think we have there 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 free floating black holes. Um, they would be de detected again by the fact that, ironically, black holes actually the not in the black hole but near the black hole stuff gets really high temperature and radiates in the X-ray right. and gamma rays and they shine. So <clears throat> the black hole itself doesn't radiate much, but there's a lot of radiation associated with them or near it, right? When you're getting right. near that that point of no return. Okay. And uh, and the more the more stuff you have, the brighter and more more hungry the black hole is, the brighter it becomes. Okay. Um, or the area around it becomes. It's, unidentified it's, Leviathan asked, um, and this is actually a kind of ongoing thing in the chat. So <clears throat> if the universe is expanding and everything's flying away from everything else, how do you ever actually get a star in the first place to collapse when all the stuff that's presumably going to collapse is already moving away from itself? Well, excellent question. I mean, the universe is expanding, space is expanding, but it's not expanding so fast that gravity can't, um, you know, uh, 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 overcome it, right? Okay. If you take a brick and you drop it towards your foot, the expansion of the universe isn't going to save your foot. You better move your foot. Okay. So it's a sort of a summation of forces. The forces pulling things apart aren't necessarily always going to be greater than the forces pulling them together. We don't know because because one of the models of dark energy is it's a property of space, and as you get as as, you, as space expands, you get more dark energy and less gravity, right. and it may get a runaway rip. Um, those are one of those questions about what the fate of the universe is. And, but that would be something in the future, not in the past. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> currently for the history of the universe, there have been situations in which the sum of forces favored gravity over expansion. Yes. Around 5 billion years ago, uh, gravity was the dominant thing, and, and dark energy started winning. Okay. Um, the fourth battle uh, about five billion years ago, when it when it started accelerating, as opposed to before, gravity was kind of pulling the was the dominant thing that was putting the brakes on expansion and slowing stuff down. And dark energy started getting more and more expansive, and it took over. And now we're back into to a slightly accelerating phase. Okay. Excellent questions, by the way. Uh, so Puffleupagus again asks, um, "What is happening when black holes pause or quote hibernate?" Uh, and then when they reactivate. So I guess this is Excellent when question. we go into an active phase versus a passive phase. Well, well, black holes come sometimes go into a feeding frenzy when there's a lot of material falling into it. But once they sort of, once the area, once the material that's, 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 that is near a black hole has spiraled in and there's not new material joining it, then you can get to a quiet phase. So... Um, and let's talk about a non-rotating black hole. If, if this is the size of a non-rotating black hole, where this is the edge at which you know, you're pointing on return, if you take that thing and go three diameters away, anything that's, that's, that's within three of this event horizon size has an orbit that's unstable, and you will eventually spiral your way into spot. Beyond three, 
you can orbit a, a black hole just nice and comfortably. Like any other mass. nudges you into it, or you've got some velocity and you're, 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 you're trying to run into it. So, so black holes, if you will, can kind of vacuum out the, the surrounding area and all the obvious stuff that falls in has fallen in and now they're not feeding as much and so they can go into a quiet phase but but then what happens sometimes is galaxies merge i mean most galaxies grow by mergers and acquisitions two galaxies merge they kind of and and, and their tensional black holes start to, to 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 spiral down towards each other as they're going around they're gobbling up all kinds of stuff and they they, they eventually had to do a nice spectacular black hole merger and you've got lots of thin stuff that's all knocked around by those merged galaxies and they will obvious stuff will then feed into those merged black holes okay. and eventually it'll kind of slow down and it'll become not as energetic and it'll go into quiet phase. okay so basically it's just the difference between whether or not the black hole is growing through matter falling into it yeah whether it's a feeding frenzy or it's basically all the easy stuff to get to it has gotten to it again yeah. there's nothing magical is it if if if, it's, if the sun were to somehow turn into a black hole the earth would still orbit right the same distance right we'd probably get just colder dark. yeah yeah <laughs> dark and cold still wouldn't be a good time but we wouldn't get sucked in that's true you that's that, that's not a good way to solve your role warring problem by the way don't, <laughs> don't turn to black and by the way, I would okay. suggest when we when we go, since we have some questions, if we go do one more forty minute cycle, we can answer. The yeah, questions. we'll we'll do one more cycle. Um, we we might not complete that cycle, but we will do at least one more because, okay. and then I'm probably going to do Skype next time because yeah. So um, I believe the next question I saw was from Unidentified Leviathan again, and he asked um, so <clears throat> I'm sorry, so we have massive stars fusing up to I think what carbon or iron at towards the end of their life. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of elements beyond that. And where and when are those formed? Well, those there, there's two there's two places that they, they get formed. Um, one of them is that when you're fusing iron, um, you're 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 building elements that are basically twice the the atomic mass, uh, atomic number of iron. So that's one of the places that in those type two supernovae, when when the mass of star collapses, that's when you, you have a shell of, of iron around a shell of I think silicon around a shell of, of oxygen around a shell of carbon around a shell of helium around a shell of hydrogen you know when that that whole thing kind of splashes together you'll get some material there are other materials that occur when neutron stars collide collide so so you've got these these giant giant piles of nucleons and when they splash each other pieces of them fly off and you got all these nuclear particles and they lump together and form stuff so we think, for example, things like gold and platinum and iridium and those those materials, some of those materials are more more easily formed by neutron stars colliding with each other than in a type type two supernovae. So the gold in your ring, probably more of that material is formed by neutron star collisions than it was in supernovae. Okay. Right. So it, is a, it is an ongoing period of research, but there's different ways of doing things. Okay, so <clears throat> the question now is more of a what proportion of these nuclei started in, say, a type uh, 1a supernova or a type 2 supernova or things like that, right? Yes, and, yeah. and, and also it, it depends upon the, 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 the type of supernovae, uh, whether it's symmetrical or it, it is off-axis, whether there's lots of, of spin on the original object. Lots of things can go into the mix of, of how it comes about. Okay. Um, and we might end up losing the connection before we get to this one. We'll, we'll, re we'll reestablish. Yeah. Uh, Rodent, no last name, says, uh, due to time dilation, what time... Uh, sorry. Due to time dilation, time slows down in a gravity well. How much does time slow near or at the uh, event horizon of a black hole? And from my understanding, time dilation approaches infinity as the... Uh, so essentially time starts to yes. stop as you get towards the event horizon. Yes. Yes. So, from the from a perspective of us, we see stuff go in from the perspective of the stuff going in. Um, it sees, you know, uh, the time speed up nearly infinitely as it moves forward. Yeah. There's some, there, there's some, probably some extremist stuff where you don't really actually get those divisions by zero. Uh, physics tends to let, not like to do that. Um, and so we think there's some some other factors involved with with the the nature of of time and Planck space and so forth okay. that probably kick in. 
So it seems like it essentially stops around the event horizon, but we're not quite sure about that because it, it gets it gets it goes on to its soul. And it... oh, there it goes. All right, I'll be right back. Don't worry. There we oh, are again. And That's there we are. Again. So, yeah, I'm going to be using uh, something other than Zoom next time, unless I decide to pay for the full version, which I uh, probably will. But Maya has a link on Twitter. Nice, so, is a, is, 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 is a nice product anyway. But yeah, it's this is uncomfortable bit, these 40 minute interruptions. Um, so, <laughs> it, it is nice and clear. I'll give it that. Yes. And, and it, it seems, to, other than this, this, this feature, which is encouraged for you to license it. It seems to be a good thing. So people could donate to your you have a Patreon, Patreon is uh, yeah. available. And um, oh my, hello, my. Yeah. So right now, uh, if you do want to donate, oh, welcome back, Maya. Hello. Speaking of doing the whole shilling thing, uh, my Patreon link is in the description. It's on my channel page. I have different tiers. Every tier gets you better stuff than the last tier. I go all the way up to $100. If you want to throw $100 at me, you get all sorts of stuff. Video requests, digital models. Uh, yeah, it's nice. Um, <clears throat> and if we just keep my view numbers up, then I will be able to be reviewed for monetization directly on YouTube. And you'll be able to send super chats. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a follow-up question from Rodent, no last name. Um, <clears throat> does that mean material, in this discussion about the black hole, does that mean material might be piling up like in a time traffic jam at the event horizon? Yeah, I mean, there, there, is, there, is, there is a thing called, you know, the, 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 the photon sphere, which is this special boundary of zero thickness in which photons move in tangents around the... So they'll 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 move not in but tangent around the, the set. Probably what's also happening is the fact that um, quantum mechanics comes into play. Here's the thing that that according to general relativity, a black hole event horizon should be a hard edge. There's usually some spot at which you're in the black hole or you're not, right? Some some zero zero sized object where it becomes you know, uh, greater than the speed of light, um, and that's the event horizon. Quantum okay. mechanics says, no, 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 no. You don't get to have those infinite precise levels. Because things are quantized. Uh, Quantist says that, 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 that the edge of the black hole should be fuzzy. It should be more like a peach fuzz rather than a hard eight, you know, billiard ball. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then it's likely that stuff heading towards that general relativity line um, ends up kind of in the fuzz where it's, it, it sometimes is and sometimes isn't in the, in the black hole, right? And in fact, mm -hmm. also recognize that objects aren't, quantum mechanics says, no, 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 you don't get to say the electron is exactly there. This particle is, is a cloud and has a probability distribution. So what happens when some of your probability distribution is inside a black hole or some of it's outside? Right? Are you in there or not? Does time slow down for you or, or not? Yeah. Um, this is pretty big, big, big difficulty in trying to reconcile what general relativity does with what, what, what quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is really good at the atomic scale of, of stuff really tiny. Relativity is really good at the universe scale of stuff. It's that boundary in between that becomes quite complicated. So that question about the person, about, oh, what happens to material falling in? You know, do, 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 they, do they go in or not? Um, most likely, the, the what's actually happening is some kind of modification of of relativity and, and quantum mechanics. Not that both are wrong, but in those extreme environments near the edge of the event horizon, um, there are other effects that come into play. Okay, I do want to uh, mention one thing. So Aqua Groundhog says he's got to go. Uh, <clears throat> my parents think I'm watching atheist content, and I want to say uh, this is science content. I do not do any anti or pro atheism or any religion content on my channel. I 
will attack certain religious ideas where they conflict with science, but I am not here to change anyone's religion, make them lose any religion, or make them gain any religion. Yeah, there's nothing There's nothing so, here pro or con in religion. There's just yeah. describing math and, and right. observations, right? If current science happens to contradict your current theological beliefs, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do about that, but I will say that, well, it maybe think have some about problems there. Yeah. Um, so I just want to point out that um, I do not consider this to be atheist content. I consider this to be science content. Science. And I, I think there's a dis I think there's a difference. And to be fair, you know, there there are scientists who are religious and scientists who are not. Right. right. It's not it's not there. I should yeah. point out since this is a Halloween special, I'm gonna go into Bacardi and see it has this Ooh, little, nice little bat, bat there. Right. So right. so so would you say that, that bats are primarily made out of things that were built by dead stars or dying stars? Yes. I mean, the hydrogen that's in bats, right. like the water content, is is primordial, right? So, well, not the oxygen. Yeah, the oxygen, oxygen is, is, is going to be relatively recent. So when you see a bottle of water and talk about the age, most likely the hydrogen's age is around 13.78 billion years. Billion. So oxygen is probably on the order of around 4.7, 4.8 billion years. But there might yeah. be some older than that. Okay. So bats are spooky animals made out of spooky stars. Yes, but okay. so are you. Well, okay, that's true. I mean, even dinosaurs yeah. are made of dead stars. That's, that's true, primarily. Yes. We have a significant hydrogen content uh, as well. Yes. And, and, and so the main, cause if you were just hydrogen, you wouldn't be very interesting. You'd be just a, a gas cloud right. um, or part of a star. But the fact that you've got all those astronomers called metals, that's where chemistry gets interesting. So right. here's the dead stars. <clears throat> there you go. Here's. The dead stars. I don't actually have a beverage with me. I should have, but it's actually not that easy to drink while doing this whole VR thing. Like Landon, I don't know if you've seen the the view page, but um, I, I like this avatar, but it makes it really hard to drink because I can't easily see my drink or easily get a drink to my mouth with this headset on. Well, you have you can have virtual drinks. I it, actually, I think I can get virtual drinks in this program, but it doesn't they, help. They, 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 they don't have throat. the they don't have the effect that 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 this exactly, does, which is but that's really I mean it you, you but it's really the case that you are primarily made of of dead stars right is most of your stuff that isn't yeah. hydrogen especially is... if you go by mass yeah because hydrogen might there might be hydrogen in a lot of the chemicals making you up but by mass you're basically carbon yeah so that that carbon stuff came again from 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 stars and mostly i mean you can generate carbon in stars but but also a good portion of that carbon also gets done in those so we have another question from a uh, rodent, no less name, uh, says, so there's a possibility that physics, standard physics may break down in a fuzzy boundary or that a different meta set of rules are at play that don't yes. manifest in, quote, the normal universe. Yes. Yeah, so so just like you say, just like, you know, there's nothing wrong with Newtonian mechanics. It does a really good job right. for making your airplanes, making your cars making bungee cord, all that sort of stuff. I mean, that, that, that's really the case. It's, it's when you get into those relativistic events of, of high velocity, high mass stuff that, that some of these, these more subtle effects become dominant. <laughs> that we call it relativistic, right? So it isn't the case that Newtonian is wrong. It's only, it's a good approximation for normal terrestrial pedestrian stuff. Well, there's there's a boundary where relativity does does a, a pretty good job, but there's there's extreme in relativity, and particularly as you get into really wacky stuff such as um, approaching a black hole and actually inside a black hole is even more right. wacky. So, um, we had a question that says, uh, "Landon, that's apple juice, right?" Um, this is this here. I believe that is the question, yeah, which I believe is the um, part. The answer is no. Um, this is part <laughs> of this Halloween theme, right? Bacardi. Bacardi, eight year stuff. Now I was starting off. Wait, that doesn't say eight year. It says ocho años. Age, age, eight years. Well, I just saw it. In, uh, is my thing changing it into Spanish? Mine says ron ocho años. Oh, it does say age, eight years in in English under that. Yeah. Darn it. And and 
And um, and then of course there's there's but earlier than that I was doing for our fine Canadian friends, Bill's Gate Chardonnay. Yes. <clears throat> In so order those of, people of... that that accuse me of being a, a cork sniffer, um, <laughs> I've been trying. Pra- Red Eye's been trying to teach me how to say it properly in Aussie. You're not supposed to say cork sniffer. That's that's how he yanked it. But it's, oh. you have to do it in the. I don't know. It's it's accents are hard. Uh, and and Aussie's Aussie's talk is also even harder. So now there was a question. Um, what if? Uh, so I, I guess um, what would happen, and how likely is it that a rogue planet might hit a star? Um, it's possible i mean you look I imagine at it'd be very rare but we, we, relatively rare um because space is really big i mean as douglas adams said it's really 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 big so right. so so we have for example right now an interstellar visitor passing through our solar system a second a recent com- one yes um and it's a comet that's that's on a, a, a orbit or hyperbole um, and so you do the orbital mechanics and you say, no, it's not orbiting our, our, our sun. It's probably doing right. a loop around in, that in the galaxy. eccentricity is over one. And, and yes. And so we happen to be, uh, in there. It'll, it, I guess it's, it goes to its close approach to the sun beginning of December, closest to earth towards the end of December, but it's, oh, so exciting. it's a Christmas visitor. Yes. And it's a very exciting for astronomers. Um, the interesting thing, of course, we now know so far from, my, my friends that do, uh, or ex- experts in spectroscopy, lots of telescopes are watching this stuff, um, is that the comet appears to be comet-like, right? The thing, this visitor, appears to have similarities to our comets. So it says we have evidence that there's at least one comet from another solar system that's similar to our comets. But, you know, it's nice to know that that our solar system isn't just a freak of having these, these we're the odd ones that have these, these snowballs in order for us to see something like this going through means that there's probably lots of, of solar systems that have their own comets. We, okay. we expected that, but it's nice to actually see something. Um, we're keen to study it to see if it's got any differences, like an isotope mixes differences, because it's going to have a whole different set of, 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 um, of history than ours. Um, it's age might be, you know, might be quite old. Um, right. It might be much older. It could even be you know, much older than our solar system. Okay. We, we, oh. So there's good, we're, we're still studying it. It's still on its way in. Right. Um, now we've had two visitors. Um, coincidence? Well, I think the answer is that we're getting much better at detecting things. Right. Um, and I expect that we'll see find more and more visitors. Now they're 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 designated as eye objects. So we had I one. Um, that was that that asteroid that zipped through. We saw it kind of on its way out, and now this comet is called I two. And so, we're, I'm looking forward to detecting I three and I four and those things, right? As they come forward, it would really, a, a rogue planet would be a really cool thing to see. Yeah. Now, I I imagine that if a planet hit a star, there'd be a big shock wave, and then it would just kind of melt. I mean, that'd be a bad, it'd be bad for the planet, but the 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 the, the star, star would, would probably be, be okay, yeah, right? Because because the star is much 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 more much more massive. Than right. the sun. So if you if you sent the Earth into the sun, sun would go, yeah, okay. You might get a little spot on it, but it go, yeah. yeah, okay. Right? And 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 you wouldn't from from far away, you wouldn't all of a sudden see the sun change color. The amount of mass that's in the in the Earth is so small compared to the sun. So it would have to be a pretty darn big sort of thing to hit the sun for it to really make much difference to the sun. Yeah, or or it could be a small star, a small you know, a brown dwarf. And a really big planet, right? That that might be a, a more of an er, a merger of, of right merger of, of, of equals. So, but, um, <clears throat> uh, JG asks, is there scarring in the CMB indicative of black holes from a previous universe? So, so cosmic background radiation, basically these the the leftover glow from when the universe went from translucent to transparent. And the photons bounced off of the last bounce off the plasma before they before hydrogen became neutral and clear around 378,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, we can detect that as microwave radiation in the sky. And then when you look at the frequencies of that microwave radiation with 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 its classic black body curve, you find there's slight deviations. And those slight deviations are what he's asking about. 
one of the things that we've at, looked for is, is there any evidence of another universe that's collided with ours and we could see imprints of that on, on that, on the background? So far, we haven't found anything. Um, there hasn't been any evidence that there, there's, there's fluctuations due to the sound waves in the early universe, right. um, but we haven't detected what we're looking for, it, right? Uh, I'm not saying it's not there. It's just that we, it's not obvious. And we're, 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 you know, more probes look for more subtle variations might show something on a bigger scale. Anyway, but, uh, back to the thing about, about, about the planet hitting the, the star. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our, our, you know, our sun is over a third of a million times more massive than the earth. So wait, if the earth got swallowed by our sun, then we go, yeah. Yeah. You might, you might see a little blip on the, on the spot. Yeah, I'm sure if you were watching while it happened, you could notice. But other yeah. than that... If you're on the Earth, it'd be a different story. But, well, yeah. yeah, you'd probably notice that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, Bob Knob did point out that there is going to be a uh, meteor shower on October 21st and 22nd. This is correct. That is not, not a troll. That is true. If you uh, go to a nice dark place on those nights, you have a very decent chance of seeing... Uh, meteors yeah. assuming that it's actually no just it matter where you are because yeah most of those are leftover specs from let's say a comet comet has lots of of, of dust trail behind it i think it's the, haley's the comet is. um and so those 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 flexile things um end up hitting our atmosphere most of the little streaks you see in the sky the so-called shooting stars um the meteors are things that are like size of a grain of rice or a grain of sand. Some of the brighter ones you see, oh wow, that was a nice one. Might be BB to P size stuff. Right. Um, and it's fun, right? That, there's, that, that's a good good thing. I recommend going to a place, getting one of those nice lawn chairs and mug of hot chocolate. Yeah. Uh, some nice music and just get up there and 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 watch the Absolutely. show. Now, maybe some bugs rarely are, are they very very fast and furious. More like you have to wait for minutes at a time before you see right yeah it's not going to be a, a, a blinding shower of sparks in your face or anything yeah but, I, I i've had two of those in my lifetime but those are rare events yeah um i'm trying to see if we have any other questions maya did you catch any other questions we haven't asked no okay well well <clears throat> i have questions i mean I, the, the my big question is what in the heck is Dark energy. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Another is good is is that dark energy uniform throughout all space, or is there like lumps of dark energy? Dark matter, the things with the excessive that Matt, you talked about the excess mm -hmm. gravitational field, there are concentrations of stuff, right? And it varies. Yeah. You know, we know it's lumpy. But but is dark energy concentrated? Does dark energy um, behave the same way now as it does in the past? And will it behave the same way in the future? Um, so is it is it con consistent over space and over time? And we don't know that. I mean, you'd say, well, why wouldn't it be? But if you don't know what it is, you can't say it can't right. be wrong, right? Yeah. Gonna, we can only talk about the effect. And the effect is that the grid of space is accelerating. Um, and that, that it started winning out over gravity around 5 billion years ago. But there's no guarantee that it'll continue to accelerate. We had a period of inflation in the early, early, early moments just after the Big Bang, where the universe did weird stuff. Um, and who's to say, maybe, is that some evidence of dark energy turning on and off, right? Right. Um, we don't know. So what is dark energy? Another question is, what is the fate of the universe? That's yeah, a, we, that's we touched on that. That's another really important question. Um, another question is, is there life outside of earth and, and, and the stuff we've leaked around um, for some value of life, right? right. It, 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 how, how common is life if it is, if there's life out there? Um, and Which, um, by another, the way, yeah. my next video is going to be about 60 minutes long and it is going to be about the topic of the Fermi paradox or the Fermi paradox. We want to pronounce it more correctly. Um, <clears throat> so stay tuned for that. It will discuss topics like, uh, so basically the Fermi paradox is, it seems like based on things like estimates as to how likely life should be and 
uh, how often stars form and things like that, that the galaxy and the universe as a whole should have plenty of civilizations in it. But we've never once seen any positive indication of an alien civilization in any galaxy yeah. anywhere in the universe. And we're not Where talking about Carmen getting, getting an anal probe. We're right. talking about a civilization go up there and you could see stuff coming from there and say, look at that thing, listen to that star, look at that stuff. You can see blip, 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 you know, something like that. We haven't seen that yet. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it's not super, super, super obvious. Right. And actually, I go into some reasons why we might not be seeing it. In, in so, so stay tuned video. to Diaper Dinosaurs. Yeah, so about that. <clears throat> that should that's, probably that's, premiere tomorrow. Actually, that's one of the that's one of the important questions um, that 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 I you know I have. Another question I have is the so-called fundamental constants, like the right. speed of light in a vacuum, the charge mass ratio of an electron, um, things of that nature. Are those Values. Why is the speed of light the speed it is? Right. Is it due to some geometry thing, some mathematical thing, or is it just happen to be that case? Are those constant really constant? Right. Or do they vary? Um, I, I do want to say there are more um, questions coming in. I want to say we okay. probably aren't going to be able to get to too many more questions, really, probably any. Right. I, so, why did we be closing can, this can, soon? Can, can you get to a bit more? Uh, yeah, let me more? see what I got. Um, my, I, I have lots of questions, but it'd be better. So there. is there a possibility that some laws of physics work differently outside of a gravity well than in? Yes. Okay. Um, but um, we have pretty, you talk about you know, within a, within a, that, that could the laws of, of physics. So maybe the better way of saying it is that could the equations we have to describe things require extra terms when you get into really intense gravitational fields. Okay. And the possibility is yes, we have, we'd have some pretty big constraints because we, we worked that out pretty well with, with observations, but we can't rule it out. Right. Um, so I wouldn't say the laws of physics change. I say that, that our, our understanding of physics becomes imprecise when you have very intense gravitational fields. Okay. Um, Especially near a black hole. I will say, um, I don't think we have time for this question. question but yeah, oh. person. Well, I think I'm, I'm not sure we really have time for Puff's question, but I do want to say a quick thing to Roden last name, and then I think we're going to say goodbye. Um, uh, Deborah Dono, uh, if there was a civilization 3,000 light years away that has been broadcasting for on the radio for 2,000 years, we wouldn't know about them for another century. Uh, well, for another thousand years, or another millennium. And that's true. Um, and so one of the the questions or solutions to the the Fermi paradox may be that. Civilizations simply don't last very long once in that broadcasting phase. Yeah. Either they stop broadcasting or they cease to be civilizations either because or, of extinction. Or, or maybe they choose to say that they value privacy over communication. Right. And, and that'll, th everything. those are all things that we, um, or that I get into. But... SETI, SET, the SETI organization, Search for Extraterrestrial yeah. Intelligence, um, has some really good papers. You go to the SETI.org site. They have some really good papers talking about this that people have really taken. And those are great questions that yeah. people are, are taking a hard look at. So, but I think we're going to say goodbye. So if Maya and Landon, if you could say your goodbyes, well, I, I plug I, anything you want to plug. I want to uh, th thank you very much for, uh, for, for attending. Um, if I can I certainly ask that you consider coming a patron of Dabba Dinosaur. Um, also my good friend, Pent Monk, John Colley. Um, he's trying to take care of his, his dad is not well and his mom. So you can become a patron or watch Pimp Monk, P-I-M-K-A-N-U-N-K. -E um, and finally, um, because someone someone asked about a atheists, um, I would I would recommend checking out Milwaukee atheists. Um, look okay. look at them on um, on uh, on YouTube. Okay. And Maya, anything you want to plug before we head out? Uh, no, I think your next video is going to be awesome, and I look forward to seeing it. All right. Well, and thank you, Maya, for joining us. Absolutely. Yeah, so your questions and thank that. By the way, chat, you actually asked some really interesting excellent yeah, questions. Yeah, definitely. That's that's all that science is about questions and, and you're asking questions. Keep asking questions. Absolutely. That's, that's, I just just keep asking questions. All right. Well, the, a very smart well, audience. <laughs> I, I do. I really do. Uh, the only thing I want to plug other than my channel and the, my Patreon is that um, Search on YouTube for the Seabad that's the Seabad show that's C B A D D. 
that mm-hmm. is a um, movie review and riff track uh, channel that I have started with Ben Tovind, uh, Bent's brother, and Cheshire Vic. We do, uh, right now we have two episodes out. Uh, our next episode should be out uh, next week. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I believe we're going to try and record an episode tomorrow, although Cheshire being ill might yeah. put damper on that. But there's a link for it. So, so Dever, I'll also I'll send you a link if you want to know about astronomy, like basic astronomy, how to how to how to buy a telescope, yeah, uh, observational yeah. stuff. I'll send you a the link. There's a there's a basic web page I have of sort of like you know stuff I've curated that, that that's pretty good about it. Um, you know, keep following NASA what the European Space Agency is doing. Um, encourage those those fine organizations to be funded. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to play my intro one more time. And uh, we will be out. You first, first, how would you decide? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know.